quickly, I mean, I think the, 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 this is the, gen, the one genocide that is being prosecuted in the Yugoslav tribunal. Um, legal experts have indicated that they think it is the most, if not one of the most of them, uh, documented since the Holocaust. Um, the safe haven happened uh, the violation of this, uh, and this uh, genocide happened under the nose of the European governments, of the European Union, of NATO, of the international community. So it wasn't that it uh, was, well, it was somehow so distant that everyone was, it was in the midst of, of the war. It's a massive failure of the NATO, a uh, massive failure of the Security Council, of peacekeeping operations. Uh, the peacekeepers were, uh, that were there were far outnumbered, we're told, so the, there's a lesson there. But I'm not sure if it's ever been uh, discussed. In fact, my understanding is that in 68 years, the UN Security Council has never done a lessons learned session. Not one. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I want to go back and look at this in the larger uh, framework for a minute. Uh, looking at genocide in history, I'm from the United States. I uh, grew up uh, in Wyoming, and my family was from the South and, and, and the Rocky Mountains. Uh, I don't think there was a day in my youth, young life that I wasn't aware. I didn't know the word genocide, but I wasn't aware that that's how we had conquered. We, the Europeans, had conquered the United States was mostly, I think, today would be considered acts of genocide uh, against the peoples that uh, inhabited this uh, part of the world. Uh, and if you go back over history, uh, I think it's a pretty strong theme throughout the last five or 7,000 years of history. So it's not that it's new. Um, what is new, I hope, is that uh, when I was young, you couldn't go 50 meters without seeing some giant monument honoring <coughs> the kinds of generals and, and war makers who committed these crimes. It was a great honor to have participated in conquering the West or uh, killing what we called Indians, and we still call Indians even after 500 years, and of course they had nothing to do with India. Um, and. Uh, so in, in my lifetime, I've seen a big change from honoring this to not honoring it. And I think that's, that's important. The 20th century was, we are told, the bloodiest, most war-ridden century in all of history. Uh, the peace group that I'm the general secretary of, and which I can be speaking on behalf of this afternoon, uh, was formed at the end of World War II. World War II ended. Uh, with the United States dropping atomic bombs on three city, or, or two cities in Japan. Uh, we're now told, whether it's true or not, that it may not have been because they were didn't want to lose a million further Americans in a, in a, in a land occupation, but it in fact was because the uh, Russians and the Soviet Union were moving in to take Japan through the islands and that they wanted to send a message to Japan, which is Part of the point I want to make, the P5 concept of the UN Charter, which is a successor to the League of Nations Charter, and it starts off, we the people, but then as soon as the preambular language is done, it goes right back into the language of the high contracting powers, and it is essentially a document of, uh, uh, of the most powerful, for the most powerful, uh, in many, many ways, and and the major powers gave themselves this enormous power on maintaining the international peace and security. Uh, and they have argued, and I think that probably some of it is still is true, that if you hadn't given the veto to the, at least the United States, Russia, China, uh, probably Russia, UK, and France at the time, but if you hadn't given the veto, then those powers would never have stayed within the framework of the of the UN Charter, which kind of serves as a fundamental basis for the international legal order. But this concept that uh, that really in, peace enforcement is really about what protects the major powers, not what protects all everybody else, is still pretty much uh, uh, survived until I think recent 
recent times. Um, the original idea I've seen some argue in the in the UN Charter was that the P5 would would be the primary peacekeepers. That they would be there would be five regional offices and they would put out all of the uh, incipient wars uh, by having each, each, they would split their armies and they would be the primary peacekeepers. Of course, that never hurt, uh, occurred, and now practically none of the peace tribes participate in, in peacekeeping uh, at, at all. But uh, that regional concept of, uh, of peacekeeping in the in the UN Charter is pretty much uh, never been uh, operationalized. <coughs> And again, I think for the for them, the uh, their security, their state security is the primary, and then anything else is collateral damage. And I think uh, uh, Frederica falls in that uh, in that category. Um, now, I do think though, in the last uh, 20 years, and maybe 25 years, but 20 years in particular, there has been some major achievements and improvements. And uh, as uh, Ambassador Winnowaser said, I think the less, a number of these are directly or at least largely impacted by what happened in, in Srebrenica and in uh, the Bosnian War. Um, you, we have had, uh, I think, significant efforts to, to evaluate how the United Nations and the international community are doing peacekeeping. And there's been, I think, some very important efforts to try and improve peacekeeping. And we have seen major, I think, developments in peacekeeping by regional and sub-regional international organizations uh, with, the, with the UN and, or without the UN that I hope give us or that provide, I think, some hope for uh, the goal of surrounding war with the rule of law. Um, I think the ad hocs and special tribunals, again, as the ambassador mentioned, have been uh, uh, directly uh, linked to uh, to the end of the Cold War and to the, uh, uh, the terrible wars in Yugoslavia and, and Rwanda and, and Timor, etc. And and the ad hoc and special tribunals, I think, uh, have a as imperfect as they've been. Uh, there's a tremendous achievement for the concept that the rule of law can compete with uh, brute power and military force as a, a, a civilizing uh, 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 instrument of power in world affairs. Uh, the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court after uh, was, uh, I think, uh, enormously impacted by the, the fact that the uh, uh, Security Council against all expectations created uh, two charters for the Yugoslav Tribunal and the Rwanda Tribunal. And I think it is absolutely the case, and, and the Council continues to demonstrate it had no intention of it being a the effort in improving the rule of law. It was a face saving, uh, time purchasing, uh, diverting uh, a strategy. That it worked uh, and has worked to some degree, I think, is in spite. Uh, of the of the intentions of the major powers and, and the council. Um, I think also the uh, after the United States government and the UK government invaded Iraq against the wishes of the of the Security Council, uh, uh, Kofi Annan converted the uh, 2005 uh, summit on the Millennium Development Goals to a UN. Peace and Security Reform Summit also, and that we did have some significant achievements uh, that we still are in early days on whether they will they will succeed. But I do think uh, the uh, United States and the United Kingdom understand uh, their foreign policy elites understand the catastrophe of what they what they uh, engaged in, and uh, and I hope that some of the decisions like the responsibility to protect norm that was agreed to in 2005. I wish the peacekeeping uh, commission had been linked to R2P because I think part of, of the genius of the, of the proposal of the responsibility to protect is not only that you had to prevent, react, but also rebuild so that if you break it, you have to fix it. 
And so uh, that if the international community has to see going all the full spectrum in order to, uh, to, to not allow countries that go into, that experience these catastrophes, then to fall back into new cycles of violence and war. And uh, lastly, I would mention, and again, I think Ambassador Lynn Wacher is one of the leaders at the UN, and world leaders, really, in proposing uh, a, a set of, of reforms within the framework of the General Assembly of the UN now for changing the way the Security Council operates, changing the way that peace and keeping and peace enforcement decisions are made and making fundamental improvements on it. And this was a, a resolution of five small countries last year that was crushed largely by the pressure of the P5, but many other countries also. But I think if it had gone forward in the, count, in the General Assembly, it would have won a majority vote. And, and again, for someone my age, that's the first time, because yes, we've had countries all over the world that say they hate the veto, but the truth is, for most of the last 80 years, 70 years, they love the veto. The veto, all they needed to do is get one veto country to protect them, and then they were, they could keep uh, the international community from intervening with whatever they wanted to do as, as dictators and military uh, strategies, etc. But now I think we do, in fact, have 90, 100, 120 countries who are willing to uh, use uh, the General Assembly and use the UN to do some genuine. <coughs> Uh, peacekeeping and peace enforcement, and I think uh, this will be along the lines of the globalization of democracy, of justice, and the rule of law in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we move to the uh, question and answer session, uh, I would like to introduce Mr. Uh, Rafi Kordic, actually I introduced him, but to call him, Rafi was in Bosnia actually during the genocide in Srebrenica, and also today ruling Rafi, probably we should put some light in on the ICTY, where the seven or eight municipalities also, besides seven, are now in the scope that genocide actually happened in your city town of uh, Prieto as well. So please. Thank you. Uh, just for the record, uh, I was not in Bosnia when genocide happened. However, uh, I, I would humbly think that I know some things about it. And I will start with when I was invited to speak, which is a great honor, and uh, as Bill said, most of what I wanted to say has already been said. Um, I concentrated on, on, on the title of the panel, which uh, literally says, why is Srebrenica still relevant to us? And in trying to understand what am I actually to, to speak about, I tried to take it apart, and first this, this term, still, uh, stuck in my head, and I realized that uh, Srebrenica will never cease to be relevant to us. And when thinking about what us uh, means, uh, of course, uh, initially, immediately, you think of the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the international community. Enough has been said already about the relevance of Srebrenica in, in international context. But uh, I will concentrate on why is Severance relevant and will never cease to be relevant to the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the community there. It is very important to understand that uh, Srebrenica is not an isolated event. It is not a genocide that has somehow happened at the end of the war as uh, an incident. But it was, to quote Amir Sulekic, uh, himself a survivor of Srebrenica genocide, but also an author of a PhD dissertation on understanding genocide in Bosnia, a culmination of a genocidal effort which had already seen a large uh, part of the territory that we today call Republika Srpska, uh, basically uh, uh, with the people that were targeted for genocide, namely Bosnian Muslims and Bosnian Croats, removed, including, for instance, villages of, around Srebrenica, which had been uh, subject to killing uh, and, and killings and, and that kind of an effort in 1992 and 93. So uh, Srebrenica stands out because of the intensity, because of the, the, the short time in it which happened, it happened 
in four days, more than 8,000 people have, uh, were killed in a very industrial way. And uh, it also stands out because of the fact that we have uh, verdicts which confirm that genocide happened, like Ambassador Shachi Bey said, International Court of Justice possibly being most important on that general level, but also in terms of people who were um, convicted of genocide and to just deadly correct, it's not only Radoslav Krstic, ICTY has convicted several other people, including Beara, uh, uh, Popovic, uh, Drago Nikolic, and Dugomir Vorovcin, and, and the court of Bosnia and Herzegovina very importantly convicted several people uh, for genocide. Uh, so, so that is the only instance where genocide was confirmed in the court, which is important for what I'm about to say, and I will try to keep it within three or five minutes, as you said. You're going to be only one. <laughs> yes, I, I was, <laughs> we at ICTJ are trained to follow the, the moderator's rules. But uh, today's decision that, that was referred to actually uh, does give hope that this will be examined in more depth. Today, the tribunal in The Hague ruled that Radovan Karadzic is to answer uh, for charges of genocide in seven other municipalities, including Prijevor, Vlasnica, and uh, others. And that is important because the judges have established that in the case of the prosecu that prosecution has already presented, they have actually submitted sufficient evidence for prima facie case that genocide did indeed take place in these municipalities. Now, the uh, challenge, of course, will be that uh, the defense will try to bring these ev this evidence into question, but even that is something that we should take into account when thinking about the following. Genocide irreversibly affects societies in which they happen, irreversibly. These societies never are able to reconstitute themselves to the situation before genocide. And for long periods of time, they are dealing with concrete outcomes of genocide. In Bosnia and Herzegovina today, we do not need a court decision to tell us how genocide reshaped our society. Genocide has changed Bosnia socially, it has changed Bosnia politically, it has changed Bosnia economically, in every possible way from the constitutional structure of the country to the fact that today the notion of community has been redefined. We do not regard community in the same way, despite the fact that we may be living in the same street. And, and people like Lori Coyne, who have just come back from there, can testify that even in Srebrenica, where you have people going to same stores, uh, their children going to same schools, do not regard themselves as part of the same community if they come from Serb ethnic background or Bosnian ethnic background. That is a direct direct outcome of genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Today's Bosnia is a wounded society. It's been 18 years and we have not moved almost not even a, a millimeter when it comes to actually dealing with the consequences of genocide in a systematic way, in an honest way, in terms of what, what would be regarded as making a break with that past, with the past in which it was possible for people to kill, kill and kill until their hands were tired of holding a gun and then take a break and kill again. And not regard that at all as something out of order. They regarded it as a job that needed to be done. So from that set of values, to today's set of values that we have in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 
we have not moved really significantly in terms of having an open, honest, constructive debate to understand what were the underlying causes that have actually made genocide possible, what was the impact on the society in various different ways, and how do we deal with it. Today's political elites in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I will, uh, I stand behind what I'm about to say, are using genocide as a political tool uh, to basically erect smoke screens uh, for people to think about, to worry about, to engage about, while their effort to plunder the country is ongoing, because, because Bosnia is undergoing not only a post-conflict transition, but also an economic transition, don't forget, from a socialist model where everything was state or people's own to the model where we live in this now uh, mutation of capitalism. So on one hand, you have the leadership of Republika Srpska, led by the current president, Milorad Dodik, who is not only not accepting that genocide has taken place, but is actively denying genocide in public statements through financing different uh, projects that are supposed to bring the alternative truth about Srebrenica and so on and so forth. On the other hand, you have the supposed defenders of the victims and the truth about Srebrenica from so-called pro-Bosnian parties that are countering this narrative. But in fact, they are coalition partners with Milorad Dodik on all the different levels of government. So in this public war of narratives, victims are completely left to themselves, completely. So today, and, and this is something that you can witness if you look at Srebrenica tomorrow. Today, Srebrenica was visited by 50,000 people, all the politicians from around the country. Tomorrow, there will be no one there but the victims themselves. And one thing that is, is, is very illustrative of, of the, the way that victims are left to themselves is that mothers of those children who were killed in uh, compose myself. Uh, maybe I'll come back to this point. They, they're waiting for DNA samples for 18 years. 18 years. That's been a tough day. So, to a more uh, of a theoretical uh, ground. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I just want to say that, that to understand how how deeply affected the society is, you need to actually know this 